And don't forget to select the questions from time to time. <laughs> All right. But we'll, we'll, be, we'll be fine. All right. Hi, everyone. Are we live? Yes, we are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Just give me one more second, and I will post all the marketing stuff really quick. And we will go ahead and get started. And if you saw the image today, so I'm going to be working on a sketch that I found and pretty much just talking about like how I, my eye and how I see uh, what I've worked on and how, what I would change about it nowadays and how that's changed over the years. Because the drawing I did while I was in college, I was a junior, so it was about three or four years ago. So I'm going to take a look at it and kind of update it. So let me go ahead and... Okay, we're ready. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Von Rieden with ConceptCookie.com, and today I'm joined by my friend Joe Chico, who's going to be doing all the questions and answers. So say hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. I mean, <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> and... If you guys have any questions during the stream, it doesn't even have to be related to what I'm working on. It could just be about uh, anything that you're struggling with or questions about getting a job in the industry, anything at all. Just feel free to ask it in the question side on the side, and Joe will make sure to select it, and I will give you the best answer I can. So we do these live streams every Wednesday at 2 p.m., and that's central time, and that's minus 5 GMT outside of the States. And I don't think I have any big updates for you guys, so why don't we just go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And then Joe, since this is his first time, he's going to periodically, I'll tell him to ask a question, but I'm sure he'll get the hang of it. And uh, so I'm just going to start off and lay out some base colors. Or what am I saying? You know what? When I see this, okay, I want to talk about, so this is a sketch I did while I was in college. And now that I look at it, I can see that there's things that I want to change. There's little, like, anatomy refinements that I could add. Because at the time, I would say, yeah, this was the best I could do. So it's good to periodically look back at work that you've done in your past and be like, okay, have I changed? Have I grown since I've done this? And this one, I definitely feel like I have grown because immediately I can see things I want to change. And um, I guess if you guys don't know what this is even from, the concept we had in school was kind of a cool one. It was pick a children's book and kind of update it and modify it to fit with like a modern style. So we had The Phantom Tollbooth, was, which was like this kind of crazy book slash movie, and um, they had all these different like negative and positive people that were all about like mathematics and science, and then um, all the evil people were like on sloth. They're like things that uh, prevent you from succeeding. And two of mine were the Gorgons of Malice and Hate. So just things that are just very negative. So I took that concept and I wanted to like do like this cool circus tent theme with their pants and the, I saw uh, Gorgons definitely since they are Gorgons of Malice and Hey I definitely immediately thought I think I was playing like God of War at the time so I definitely thought of those serpenty evil uh, villains. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a slight repainting on the side here using the original as kind of my uh, base. And it's working off of that. Oh, and Joe, if you can't see the questions, you have to actually open the Q&A tab. Oh, no, I'm, I'm on top of it. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, do you want me to ask the first one? Yeah, go ahead. All right. It's a question, and it's, my drawings always look flat after I shade them. How to not overdo with the lighter parts? Could it be that my color values are too close to each other? Question mark. Oh, and make sure you select it so that I can oh. just look over and read a part of it if needed. Boom. Selected. There we go. <laughs> um, so I guess if they're looking flat, what about it looks flat to you? Do you feel like you added a light source? And I know that I always say add a light source, but you, maybe this is something you don't want it to be like over dramatic or too intense or too strong. So you can definitely have subtle... Uh, value shifts, and it still reads as the values that you're trying to give off. I do think that if it says the color values are too close to each other, yes, definitely, like, think, like, for this guy, if his skin color is, like, a muted blue, and then the crystals that are kind of jutting out of him are also a muted blue, it's kind of hard to see the transition where, even interest-wise, for the viewer, it'd be much interesting if I had, like, the gems be, like, a saturated orange or something, and that contrast just in hue and saturation 
is so much more interesting than if, if they were both muted blue. But obviously there are times where you're going to have both of the colors be muted. Like it's not always just going to be bright and um, dull next to each other. So when it comes to that, you have to be really conscious of where you're laying your values and making sure that they're not kind of bleeding and blending into each other too much. Because then that's where you get it looking too flat, I, I believe. I'm trying to think of how ugly I want to make this guy. Here we go. Oh, and something I should have been doing more is flipping my canvas, seeing how it looks from the other direction. All right. Next question from Shelby Randolph. Any tips on choosing the right career path? I wanted to go into, anim into animation, but now I really like doing concept art. Your, re your website courses are helping a lot. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Uh, I would definitely say, you know, really think about it for yourself. Don't let other people be influences on you. I mean, that's good that they are influencing you, but this is going to be something you're doing for the rest of your life, most likely. So you want to make sure that, in the end, you're happy with the decision you're making. And if you really do feel like concept art is something that you are happy creating and, like, as you're doing it, you're like, I love doing this, I could see myself doing this, then, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just know, though, I mean... I'm sure a lot of artists know that this is not the easiest career to get into, and a lot of times it takes a pinch of luck, and a lot of it is who you know. So definitely know that if you get into this industry, it's not just all about drawing. A lot of it is like being able to market yourself and um, being able to, uh, what's that word, network. There we go. And uh, I think a lot of artists don't take that into consideration when they're getting started. But on the, on the good news on that, uh, if you are really, really good at what you're doing, uh, I think it is, uh, who's the artist? I think, I'm not going to say it if I don't know it, but his quote was, top talent is always in demand. And I truly believe that if you are a like, super successful artist in, or not successful, if you are like just a really well-rounded like, you can do work really efficiently, really effectively on, like, a schedule. And I think those are the artists that will make it no matter what. But just know it takes, it takes a lot of dedication to get to that point, and you do have to spend a lot of time practicing. I think that's something I wish more artists kind of knew going into it. We have a question that kind of goes along with that one, and it's any advice when introducing yourself to a company or someone that could recommend you to one? Um, play it cool. Do your best not to fanboy. If it's, like, for a big company, you want to be very presentable and very respectful and very professional. And usually I don't like using the word professional, but I think there's times where you can joke around and be buddy-buddy with people, and then there's times where you really do have to, you know, step it up and really be <laughs> professional. And I think when you're meeting someone, especially if it's for a big-name company or something, you definitely don't want to you know, keep reemphasizing how big of a fan you are, how much you love them. Like, you want to really showcase your skills and your personality rather than just showcase that you're a fan. Because I, I, in my opinion, if you applied to work at this place, uh, there's a good chance that you're already a fan, and they can assume that. So from that point forward, just really put on your, you know, professionalism hat and show them that you can not only just be a fan, but you can also be a diligent worker. Would you say shaking hands is some good advice as well? Uh, yes. <laughs> just avoid <Sorry>. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just make sure you do a strong grip. I, I remember I had a class that we, we literally had to practice shaking hands, and I thought it was the most absurd thing I've ever done in my life. But yeah, just avoid doing like the fish grip. Don't grab their fingers, grab their <laughs> hand. I mean, things that should be obvious, but maybe to some people it's not as common sense. Well, I think it's when you shake someone's hand, it's very like, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's relevant of why you're here, as opposed to just standing on the side, like holding your sketchbook, like shaking or something like that. You know, looking <laughs> intimidated. 
Oh, yeah, be, uh, this is another easier said than done, be confident, especially walking into that um, application. Well, I don't know if it's like an application room per se. Oh, no, I did this on the same layer. That's okay. You gotta love when that happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a question from Call Me Calv. Hi. Right. I've been studying anatomy for a while, and sometimes my anatomical drawings look good, but most of the time I just suck, and I don't really have a step-by-step -step to my anatomy drawing. Do you have any tips on learning anatomy? Uh, yeah. I mean, you definitely have to practice a lot for anatomy. Like even there, even now, I still feel like I'm learning stuff about anatomy. Like, even though I feel like I've learned enough tips and tricks where I can kind of get away with areas, even if it may look slightly incorrect, but that's not to say I in, I'm, like, just brushing it off. I still realize that I need to learn to do all the anatomy accurately. But, like, this is a good example. Like, look at the arm that I used to do. Now, I know that this is still, like, a stylized character, and obviously I'm not going for exact proportions and, like, uh, absolute correct anatomy, but if you have somewhat of a good like, impression of realistic anatomy, I think that helps the overall design. So, like, this arm, I'm definitely more aware of, like, where the biceps place and how that gets translated into the forearm. Because over here, there's, like, a weird bend. And if he was to bend his arm, it would look kind of loopy. Now, I know that this character is a little tougher because I do want it to look slightly realistic with, like, an edge or some kind of a stylized look to it. So I can definitely exaggerate proportions. But if you have a realistic impression of the anatomy underneath, that'll help just so much more. I think that was way too large. I should make that a little litter. Little. I think it was actually Sykra that was talking about how you can get away with exaggerating proportions and not having exact anatomy, but you still have to give the impression of anatomical forms. Speaking of Psychra, on your last stream, you and Psychra mentioned that working with unsaturated colors are easier to work with. But how do you work with very saturated colors? Um, when you're working with saturated colors, you want to be very, very uh, aware of... This is kind of tough because I know there's some artists that use it like super well with super saturated colors. Like a purple Kecleon is a great example where a lot of her colors are just... Most of them are saturated, but she keeps them cohesive and she keeps them in harmony with one another. So I would be very aware of the value of those colors and making sure that you still have some saturation contrast. So even if all your colors are like overblown saturated, you still want like your focus point of area to be slightly more saturated than the other areas. Or if there's a point of interest that you really want to point the viewer's eye at, make sure that you give some contrast in the saturation. So I would say it is tougher, but it is doable. We have a bunch of great questions lined up. Um, <laughs> here's, a, here's a pretty good one. How do I balance my art career with my social life? Can I be a great artist and social? Uh... I want to answer this honestly. <laughs> um, if you want to be a great artist, your social life is going to take a hit. I would say there's a lot of days where I don't do anything but draw. And then, like, you can talk to people on Skype. Obviously, it's not the same as meeting or, like, hanging out in person. But if you want to be a successful artist, I do think the amount of time you have to invest is greater than what might appear on the surface. So yes, your surface, your social life will take a hit, but just know that it'll be worth it down the line, or at least I hope it is, because even right now I feel like I am definitely um, not as social as I used to be. But I, I feel like more productive. I feel more accomplished. I don't know. It's a tough choice of like how much social life do you feel you need, where I don't really feel like I need much anymore. Like I'm very much satisfied with just hang out and talking to my friends on Skype while we draw, or just have a Skype hangout and everyone draws. So I guess it's also the people that you're hanging out with. I say draw the people that you're hanging out with. <laughs> <laughs> I would say maybe to that question. 
if you're really determined to make both work, it can work. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's go to the bottom. I've Same. just started off digital drawing, and my question is, should I stick with my comfort zone, or should I try practicing everything? Also, should I use bases from other people? Um, bases. I'm, I'm wondering if they mean the line art. Oh, yes. That's actually a great way to focus solely on color. Actually, I think this was an exercise I did. Um, was it the shape challenge? I forget which one it was, but yes, when you're given line art, and this could just be a personal thing where I really like being given line art because then a lot of the concepting is already done for you. And then all you have to do is really set your mind and focus on uh, like value shading and laying in your colors and keeping your light sources consistent. Like those are things I, well, I find those really fun to do. I'm sure other people dread doing that just like I dread environments. But given line art really lets you focus on specific areas. So yeah, I think that's a great way to practice. All right. Artists have different ways of practicing. So how do you practice drawing from primary blue? Um, you want to see what I did this morning? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, I'm going to zoom out. So usually I like to do just a few warm-up sketches just to get my hand moving. So like... Doo -doo -doo. It's like literally it could be something as simple as a mouth with teeth. Or I think I did a quick jinx sketch. Just anything to get your mind into the mode of drawing and like, I don't know, just like a good minute or two just wake up and get ready for the drawing day. I totally woke up at 4 a.m. and did material studies for t-shirts. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I see, um, those are just as useful, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, learned a lot about wrinkles, that's for sure. <laughs> Here we go, a question from Nix. Recently, I've been feeling pessimistic about my current university, taking game art and design. I've completed a year, two left. I don't know if it's worth... Ooh, it just bounced. Hold on. Okay. I don't know if it's worth the money anymore, but I can't figure out another option. Do you, did you ever feel this way about school? Yes. Actually, I don't think my situation could be any more similar to yours, where I would say about a year into it is when I started questioning the actual education system and what I was being taught for the amount of money that um, the tuition was. And I remember even questioning if I was going to drop out. And for a while, I thought I was going to be a children's book illustrator. And, like, that was my... I was pretty set on that for a little bit. But I don't think it was worth going to art school. But it's easy for me to say that now since I have a job. And my school got me the portfolio show in which I got my job. So it's hard for me to say that it didn't get me in the industry. Do I think it's worth it? No. Am I really glad of the networking experience and opportunity it gave me? Absolutely. I think you can still find that online, and it's tougher for sure. Definitely having that in-person classroom experience will give you more for your money than an online experience would in that way, but I do feel the actual education and what you're learning is so much stronger online than it is in person. Now, that's not to say... Like, life drawing, I think no matter, even if you have the worst teacher and worst facility, you'll still learn a lot in a life drawing class just because it's so individual focused where you kind of are able to look at things in person and define the shapes. So I do think no matter what, like, life drawing will be amazing for you. But besides that class, I do think you can learn everything online. All right. Hey, Tim. Thanks a lot for all the help with the concept plus 3D advice over the past few months of live stream. I've been working more with human form and going to my first draw life drawing group tonight. Any tips on getting the most out of my time there? From D Brown. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, I do think if you go to a life drawing session, really analyze how you're interpreting the shapes that you're seeing and how you are laying them down on paper. I think a lot of the times, and I got into this rut of like even life drawing, where I would just kind of reproduce the same thing because I would just go on autopilot. Because for me, I wouldn't really be thinking so much when I was doing life drawing, and I think I should have been more because I think I could get away with making the anatomy look right enough. And I think it wasn't so much like I was purposely trying to cheat it, but I think I, in the long run I was cheating myself where if I was really treating it more of like a learning experience where it's like, okay, now I want to make sure I really like study the kneecap and make sure I really look at the forms in the knee and make the shadows look accurate. I think with a, that kind of a mindset, uh, you can go in it with, or you can come out of it with uh, learning so much more than if you go into it blindly or with, like with no goal set beforehand. I mean, you'll still learn, but try to at least think of something that you want to work on before this, the actual uh, figure drawing and then see if you pick something more out of it because of that thought. Uh, Cal Call Me Calv uh, responded to our response and uh, said, how do I know if my hard work is going to pay off? I've been working really hard on anatomy, like I said before, but I feel very, but I, before, but very little improvement. Do I keep working hard at it? It's one of those things where I can't honestly promise anything of like, yeah, you'll be fine, you'll get a job. Because I think giving empty promises to artists is actually a bad thing, and I think it's better to be honest with people, so it might not work out. And I know that sucks to hear, but I think it's something that you need to hear. But if you do keep practicing, I promise you will see growth growth in yourself and uh, your actual skill level. And in time, if you do keep building up that skill level, you will get noticed. I guess that's the best advice I can give you without promising that, like, yeah, for sure you'll get a job, you know. So that's my answer for that. Draw every day. <laughs> and draw every day. I'm sorry. That should be <laughs> the number one thing. I should just say that at the beginning at every live stream. Yeah. Did everyone draw today? Okay, good. Now let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, so many questions, and I want to pick all of them at the same time. <laughs> I know, and sometimes I, I draw on about nothing, so I'll try to keep my answers shorter. Um, Lemon Thunder asks... How I like that name. How necessarily is <laughs> how necessary is rapid thumbnailing to creating an interesting concept, or is it just a method of guessing what a client wants when doing a job? Um, no, I would say it's important. Like even I will do thumbnailing. Like if I'm doing a new character concept for, like even if it's personal work, like I'll usually do a few thumbnails first before I go right into it, and it's not so much like help you create like more accurate forms or anything by any means. If anything, your forms should look pretty like ratchet. I think that conce concepting phase sometimes allows you to see interesting shapes or interesting ideas start forming because of you're laying out different ideas in front of you. And I think having that uh, that speed and doing them so quick gives you that sense of little commitment, so you don't feel like you're obligated to like finish that drawing or you know start detailing it. So I think yeah, you can definitely uh, get something out of doing little stuff like that. Just let me know if I need to stop asking questions. <laughs> oh no, literally the entire stream. That's what this is for. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if it was just for me to draw something pretty, I wouldn't have questions. I mean, that's why I want to do these streams to have. People interact. All right. Um, but that's why I need you. I can't, <laughs> can't do it at the same. concentrate on finding questions and yeah. answering them. Um, Primarily Blue asks, do you have any tips of breaking the idea of perfection when drawing and painting? Do you have any tips when breaking the what? The idea of perfection. Ooh, that's a tough question. Because I feel like as artists, we always are struggling to achieve that look of what perfect means to us. Yeah. <laughs> I, c I can only tell you, don't let it 
bother you. I think for the longest time I was trying so hard to make something look perfect or like have the eye look 100% accurate. And I think in the time I would waste like literally an hour or two just working on like an eye socket. And it, it is such a waste of time that my biggest advice is move on, maybe come back to it later, but just know if it's not 100% accurate or perfect to realism or what is considered perfect realism, don't let it bother you. Who was who was the artist that that did the video on drawing without fear? That was John. No, no, no. Uh, Jonathan. No. Oh my gosh. This is why you can't ask me questions that are. <laughs> <laughs> who was that? Oh no, it was it was John Thacker. Yeah. What am I saying? Okay. Yeah, because I feel like that. Um, like the idea of perfection is a fear that we have. Like we're trying to make this like perfect drawing, and it's because we're afraid to fail at something. And you know, definitely don't need to just do it. You know, just hang, just let it all <laughs> hang out. I guess. Yeah. Um. Simona P asks, "How do you feel we're to add light?" When you don't have a reference, do the rule does the rule less is more right in this case? Um, for like adding lights. Is she asking? Yeah. Where to add light when you don't have a reference? Does the rule Oh, okay. I guess my general rule is to do so like if I was doing lighting this guy, for example, I would do slightly above head and to a side. And that gives you, so like if I did it right in the front, everything would be kind of pillow shaded. Or if I did it below, it would get that dramatic effect. So I would say if you don't have life re light reference, um, the safest place to put it is above slightly into the side. That way you can get some form shown. Because if you put it right overhead, a lot of harsh shadows would be cast like under the nose, under the eyes. But if you put it slightly to the side, and usually I put it in the front of them as well, so, like, I always think of, like, uh, 3D modeling. And I'm, this is the one thing I really did like about my art school is having this 3D background. I always think of things in a 3D space. So the light would be coming from there. I don't know if you guys can actually understand what I'm trying to <laughs> draw out right here. But, like, if this was my person, so let's say mm -hmm, this red guy is my person, and then my light source would be coming, like, in front of them, maybe like five feet in space, and then about five feet, uh, earn like ten feet above their head, and that will give you that very simple lighting situation. I'm just gonna work on this guy's upper half since we're already halfway through the stream, and I wanna have something that I'm pretty proud to show at the end. Heather asks, going into photography and illustration, but I'm not planning on going to college. You got your job through school. Would you have would you have network advice out of a school setting? Yeah, so it's definitely a lot of self-marketing. I, I even remember right out of school, I had to create a Facebook profile set up, and then literally, like even for Concept Cookie, I had to create social markets for every site that seemed viable. So... Uh, DeviantArt, Tumblr, Facebook, CG Hub at the time, Draw Crowd, uh, Twitter, like anything that will get the word out. Because I think a lot of artists have this weird assumption that if I'm good enough, people will notice me. And while that's true, you really have to be like a fan phenomenal artist to just get noticed out of the blue. And I think it's easier if you start marketing yourself and in time, you will get the attention that you need to land, uh, like, larger attention. And it's kind of hard advice for me to say that, because not going to school at all, I don't know. I, I still think you can get a job and land one not going to school. I just think the networking does become a little easier having that background in school, because not only from your teachers or from 
uh, the, like the job setups or even they usually have like a career services help you a couple months after you graduate. But even the friends that you make in school, those might be the people that you are, you know, getting your jobs from. Because if your friend gets a job somewhere you and like they are hiring, they could tell you and then you could apply and then you get that, you know, that recommendation from your friend. And I think that's why school is still a viable option. But um, not going to school, I still think you should try to market yourself strongly and try to have a network of friends that you can kind of communicate with. Oh, and for those who are wondering what I'm doing right now, so I just laid a base coat underneath that line art layer, and I changed that line art layer to a multiply. And pretty much, I'm just trying to build up simple forms with a soft edge brush, and then I'll start refining them as I kind of decide, like, where I want different edges and lighting to go. But as you can see, like, right now, it's kind of pillow shaded, but there's still somewhat of an impression that the light is overhead. Oh, you're good, Joe. <laughs> Question from Levi it says, Tim, what books, what books, ooh, and then a question just popped up. That's really annoying. <laughs> um, That's why you got to select it first. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Okay, Tim, what books do you advise for beginners in drawing? And if you know the 3D total book techniques of digital painting, if so, what do you think? Yeah, I know the 3 or the book that you're talking about. I believe they have multiple issues, and that's a great book. I would say for beginners, and I feel like I'm, I feel like I should be the spokesperson for this book. But Color and Light by James Gurney is a great book, and I feel like uh, not only beginners but even advanced users can still pick up advice and tips and tricks to use in their work. So I think that's a great book. I think having an anatomy book of some kind is great, and even though. I try not to recommend anatomy books because I think a lot of that also does come to, um, to personal preference. Like the ones I really like usually have more frail body types that are definitely like the opposite of what a comic book hero anatomy book would be. I actually do not prefer that kind of anatomy. And obviously we all have the same um, anatomical structures for the most part. It's just how much they're built, the different... I like body types that are a little strange, or a little off, or a little thinner, a little leaner. And I think that's why I have my anatomy book that is uh, has kind of a frail uh, male and female um, model that he drew from. So I think just at least any kind of anatomy book is good. And then uh, art of books are great, but I would say those are for more if you're a little more serious about art stuff. I wouldn't say it's so much of beginner stuff. Um... I think those would be my two biggest recommendations is at least James Gurney's Color and Light and then some kind of anatomy book. Uh, there's a question, but I feel like we need to hold this question for later when we start working on the crystals. Um, so I'm going to go to a different one. Uh, right. Question from Heather. I've uh, been trying to work on anatomy more, but but have been... Oh, I need to hit done on that one. I've been trying to work on anatomy more, but I have been out for some 15 weeks due to a drawing-related wrist injury. Any, tis, any tips on getting back in balance in a balanced sense? Ooh, that's tough. I always feel so bad for artists that go through in, um, like a personal injury from drawing. Like Loesch, I remember following her, and she like documented her whole progress with her... I believe she had like tennis elbow or something. And she struggled. She was, It was really rough, and um, like not being able to draw definitely hurt her, she felt. But I think getting back into the flow, I think being more aware of the problem and why it started hurting in the first place. So if you're bending it at a weird angle, you definitely have to like relearn how to draw and like maybe push your tablet more to the side or something where you're not pushing your wrist at like an awkward angle. It's like when you play piano, you're not supposed to bend your wrists down but it's natural to do it, but then you have to be like very conscious of pulling them up. So I think you have to do the same thing for drawing. So yeah, definitely just being a little more aware of why the injury came about in the first place, and then doing your best to prevent it. Stretch and take breaks, too. And take breaks. <laughs> I know there's been 
I remember in uh, college, the longest I went without getting up, I think, was slightly under eight hours. So I would say maybe like once every two hours, just go get some water, go to the bathroom or something. <laughs> eat. <laughs> and eat. <laughs> Um, any advice on how to get motivated to actually pick up the pencil by Anna Daly? Whew. This, I used to say something, I used to give a different answer, but I think because I've gotten this so many times now, I would say I can't, you can't expect other people to want it for you. You have to want it for yourself. And the worst thing that you can do is finish a picture and then post it online, and then wait for like likes or comments or um, look for other people's approval of your work. I think it has to come from within and being very self-satisfied with what you finish. So for a lot of the times, I'm motivated to draw just because like, like I watched a TV show last night, Face Off, and they had a tree challenge, and I was right there. I was just inspired to draw a tree. I didn't need anything more than that, and... That helped me. That right there just helped me pick up the pencil. So it wasn't for any other reason besides the fact that I got inspired and I wanted to show it on paper. So I hope my hope for you is that when you get inspired or you see something or you want to create something really cool, that you won't need a reason. You just will. And I know that that's one of those things. It's easier said than done. But maybe next time you're going through the struggle, just know that I'm right there kicking your butt and being like, just do it. Just do it. So then once you're done, it's so satisfying, or at least in my opinion. It's so satisfying to be like, I made this. Like You can actually see the work that you put into something. And I think having an actual finished product really is gratifying to see, you know, because then you see your work right in front of you. Okay, this guy's starting to look a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with red crystals, I think. We've been working on too many clowns lately. I know, right? <laughs> oh, that's... If uh, anyone's curious, at the end of the stream, I'll show you guys. I've been working on a fan art piece for next week's Wizard Con, which I will be at in Chicago, Illinois. And I've been working on a Digimon fan art piece, and I just finished Piedmon. If any of you even know what that show is or who Piedmon is, he's definitely a clown. And before that, I drew, like, three other clowns. So, yeah, I'm definitely on a clown spree. And I'm drawing kind of a clown right now. So, yeah, this is my clown phase in my artist career. <laughs> Savage Shoe would like a quick demonstration on how you, to, how you can quickly sketch out a pose. Any of our choice... He says, I find it very difficult, and I would love to see someone do it live. Maybe seeing your technique live could help me. All right. Uh, what pose? <laughs> I'll create a new layer of it really quick. Um, okay, so I guess... Let me move this to the side. So when thinking of a pose... Uh, you definitely want that your line of action. Like you actually, actually even start with that. There's a lot of things that you should be thinking about before you even lay down the first stroke. The first should be what pose do you want them in. So let's say I was just doing a. I'll first do a basic pose. So what I would do first, and I'm, I don't want to use the soft edge brush. I use the chalk brush. All right, first thing I would do is I usually set up my backbone, and it doesn't have to look anything like a backbone. Just give me an indication, and then I'll give my shoulder line, my hip line, and this right here gives me the proportions of the entire body. And I know you're thinking, what are you talking about, Tim? That doesn't make any sense. Well, if this is the width of my waist, and this is the width of my shoulder, and this is the length of my back, that will give me the proportions of everything else I need. Because the arms go about here. The elbow will just be somewhere near the belly button. The arm will go down to here. The hand should go about halfway down the leg, so that I can meet that in my head here. And as I lay down my feet... So I guess it's a lot of like little tips and tricks that I just know. Like I've done this so many times that I don't even have to think about it. Like I could just go on to autopilot. But the way I've always started everything is with my backbone and then my shoulder and then my waist. Because then once I get that done, then here's my person. 
And then I, from here, then that's when you build up your shapes. Then I know, okay, the shoulders build off there. I usually draw like spheres for there. And like I could take you through the entire process of how I draw the body, but just know for the most part it's a lot of shapes. So I think very shape, um, shape I don't want to say shapular. I feel like that's a word I just made up. Uh, shapular, I'm going to say that anyways. And I kind of just build it down the body and work around there. But let's say, I think what you're asking is how to do like a specific pose. So let's say I did kind of a dynamic one with like a girl flying through the air. So I always start with my backbone. We're going to even get some perspective going in here. So then that's when I'll usually draw like spheres to represent how close it is to the viewer. I've, man, this feels like I am recording a tutorial right now. <laughs> um, so let's say, so for this, it is a little tougher because for me, I'm so used to doing like normal poses. Even the Gorgon that I did long ago is in a normal three-quarter view pose. So when I'm doing something like this, I really have to be conscious of where I'm placing all my shapes. So let's say this was the head. Um, what do I want her arms to be doing? Actually, I want her arm to be going up. So a lot of the times, I'll even like change the angle of what I'm do or what I'm creating. So let's say I want her arm to be kind of like flying back. And while I'm doing this, I'm still keeping in mind this initial backbone with the uh, uh, proportions that I've kind of created. So let's say she's flying kind of this way. And things that are closer in perspective will just appear larger. So I'm not drawing this orthographically, and that's another 3D term, but I'm drawing it in perspective. So then I would keep her hips. So you probably wouldn't even see that back arm, really. And even this, I would probably have to edit and, like, nudge things over a little bit in places. So I guess when you're laying it out, don't feel like you have to get it perfect. If It's okay, it's okay if you have to, like, uh, move things slightly or erase parts. I think one of the best things a teacher told me was an eraser isn't a mistake, it's a change of mind. And I think that's helped me be like, it's fine if you lay it out and it's incorrect because then you can change it to be accurate after. But just getting that motion down and getting that feeling that you're trying to get first is uh, important because that you can't get once you refine everything. For the most part, you have to get that during the initial phase. She's like looking that way. So yeah, this is how I would do kind of like a pose if it was more dynamic. All right, let me erase that and get back to this guy. So I've got about, I won't say 20 minutes because I know we started late to finish this guy. So I'm going to do my best to uh, kind of push this and punch it through. Let me know when you're going to start working on the crystals. All okay. right, it'll be soon. All right. I'm going to work with the circle hard edge brush. Actually, all okay, right, so here's something I'm going to show you guys. Oops. All right, so I'm going to merge all these layers together so they're on one. Oops, but not the line art layer. All right, so I got all my colors. I'm going to duplicate that layer. And I know you guys can't see my layer mode, so I'll have to explain what I'm doing. Oop. Okay, so I'm making a duplicate of the layer. So it's pretty much all the layers minus the line art layer. And since I'm in a rush, so this is what I would do if I had a limited amount of time. So rather than detailing it like pristinely like I've been trying to up to this point, I'm going to multiply it. Because when you multiply it, you can get your shapes a lot more intense or like your values a lot more intense quickly. And this is how you can build up values and a silhouette really fast. So then from here, what I would probably do is then work on a layer above that initial line art. I would edge it out just slightly. And you can tell how I'm creating that silhouette. So then what I'm trying to do is then the intensity of this backlight will be also kind of reproduced in my highlights on the actual character. So let me first edge this character out just slightly so I can keep going.
Oh, and Joe, you can keep asking questions. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm just like captivated by the creepiness going on. In that guy. <laughs> I think it's the fact that the crystals are grown out of the back of his skull. It's just weird. A little bit. Um. Johnny asks, I'm having trouble rendering color, such as what color would yellow be if it's if it's in shadow or light? Do you have any suggestions or techniques that could help? I already I already have in red color and light by James Gurney, but maybe I missed something. Uh, you definitely chose the hardest color to work with. He said yellow, correct? Yes. Yeah, yellow is, in my opinion, the hardest color to work with, just because it's the lightest in value for the most part. In terms of saturated, like a yellow, what people normally think of yellow is already really saturated. It's so like that color. I know you can't even see my color picker right now, but on my saturation color picker, it is all the way up. It's at the very top. So this is saturated, and in my opinion, it's not even like that bold. And you can go more towards like orange, and it be does become more pop out. But I always get asked this about like working with yellow. And my advice is uh, to keep it limited keep it isolated, and if, you like, yellow is, like, your main wardrobe choice, like, the entire wardrobe is yellow, work with a darker yellow and then really pop the yellows through, like, the highlights or isolated areas. Because if you try to make the entire garb a very, like, bold, vibrant yellow, that's going to suck all the attention away from the other areas. So you have to be very careful about how you go and use yellow. So, like, sometimes it's easier for me to just show rather than tell. So on um, this character, I was probably going to make, like if I was going for the traditional like circus tent look, I would probably have red and yellow stripes on here. Now for yellow, my base color, I would use this. I would never use, like, let me use a different yellow here. I would never use, like, this, like a banana neon color as my base color. Because then how do you, how do you work with that? You can build up your shadows, but you're still you're almost trying to cover up how intense this yellow is. Where I could even choose that same yellow and build up my yellow on this orange garb. And not even orange, it's like a muted brown. Well, I guess orange, or brown is technically just a muted orange. Because brown's not a real color in the spectrum. So you can see how you build it up on top of that base color. So that base color still bleeds through a little bit, but it's not nearly as intense as that banana color. But now let's say I use that banana color for like the highlights. It's like down here, and it's a little baggy, so it's not going to be like a perfect transition between light and shadow. So something like that I think is much more effective than, and it still shows that like this is a yellow garb, but uh, it's not like s sucking all the attention from the viewer to be looking at it. And it's very bold, so obviously yellow will still grab the viewer's attention, but if you try your best to keep it more subtle, you'll definitely be, you'll be left with something that I believe is uh, not quite as intense. Yeah, you're right. The guy that I'm working on right now is just turning out super creepy. <laughs> like, even after I just worked with that yellow, going back to, like, this muted <laughs> gray weird color that I'm going with here. Yeah, and then once I start working on the crystals, I'll show you guys how you can really make them look effective really quickly, too. All right, next question. Mm. Hey, guys, I'm leaving my job as a game designer and going back to school for Masters in Illustration. I'm considering freelance for the first time to help me and start setting a good client base. Any tips on how I should go about doing this? Um, so like I said earlier a little bit, definitely market yourself big time. Uh, if you're really looking for like smaller type commissions, this is something that me and my friends talk about all the time. Uh, even on DeviantArt, start there. And I know DeviantArt sometimes gets a bad reputation for being... Uh, oversaturated with not the best art, but
But I've always really enjoyed DeviantArt. I think it's a great source of inspiration. They usually have something, they always have something new every day. And there's, there is quality on DeviantArt. Sometimes you have to look for it, but if you just keep on the main page of like what's hot, I believe is the category it's called, like it, usually the top like 15 rows are really good, well-rendered art. Uh, so you start there and then try doing fan art pieces. Because when I did commissions, I I know that most of my uh, commission work was all fan art and a lot of OC art too. So I do think uh, that's a great place to start out doing commissions. And then you build a reputation too because not only then are you getting your money, but then you're also building uh, like a market base. Like if someone commissioned you to do like a League of Legends fan art, well then, if you do a really well job or a good job, and it gets recognized by the league community, well then you have a whole bunch of new viewers that didn't look at your page before. Oof. Okay, I really gotta get cranking on this guy if I want to make him look presentable. But keep asking questions. All right. I'm looking for the one that uh. Well, that was that I saw earlier. It was about the crystal. They wanted to know how or how do you approach backlighting crystals or jewels? How do I approach backlighting? Um. Okay, so to do something like that, let's say I had a light in the back here, and I think to make it easier to see, let's make it a yellow light. So imagine if there was a yellow, and this is the color I told everyone not to. Use. <laughs> uh, imagine there was a yellow light from back here, and it's being shown up on the crystals. So the one thing, okay, so with crystals, there's definitely, oh, I'm going to zoom in so you guys can really see this. So I'm going to be working primarily on, like, these back crystals here. So I think the, the best thing that you can do is have one edge that really showcases where the light is coming from. So the first thing that I would do is I would probably have a really intense side. It's going to be slightly harder because my background color is going to be pretty close to this color. And a lot of that yellow has to bleed through the crystal. And when I say that, I mean, so I'm thinking, so let's do just like a very sharp-edged crystal here. I don't want to make it too complicated. So if the light's hitting here and penetrating the surface here, there's going to be a little more yellow bouncing through, and it's going to kind of gradient out to the other edge. Do the same here. Now the hardest thing that I got to try to um, not kind of cover up is that the crystal itself is red. So there's definitely going to be some saturation because the light is still catching in the crystal and it's absorbing some of the color of the crystal itself. So it's not, the color isn't just going to be purely depending dependent on the light color. Go ahead and oh, sorry about that. <laughs> or maybe I will make this more of like a a yellow. There we go. And the one thing you have to be very conscious of are the edges of a crystal. The edges, I think, are what sells the crystal in general. So let's say, because right now it's looking really flat in my opinion, it's not looking like a crystal. So to fix that, I'm going to really highlight these edges quite a bit. And then I'm going to use white as kind of like my highlight, and that will really intense the color. Now I wish I should have been doing this on like a darker background just for this little example. So maybe if it was more like this, it's easier to explain. Okay. Grab my white again. So my white will be edging off on these crystals. Now since the light is coming slightly from the back, I 
could put like a little gradient right there. Now, for me, this is probably one of the worst crystals I've drawn, in my opinion. I don't, actually don't really like how this is looking. But when it's looking so flat like this, usually I'll make the crystals more translucent. So then I'll pick up that background color, and this should help it a little bit. And then I will lay it right on top, as if you can kind of like see through the crystal. So usually this will save a crystal if it doesn't look that great. So let's see what it does for me here. Because especially if you're working really fast, like if this, like I was trying to do a second ago with the concept, you definitely have to pull out any of your little tips and tricks that you know to get it done fast. And this is one of mine for crystals. Oops, hold on. Sorry about that. I gotta put my phone on mute. There we go. Okay. So now from here, grab my white again. And then lay out some scratches on the top. So something like this gives the impression of a crystal. Now, like I said, I would probably pull up reference. If I really want to do a nice job where I felt like that was a little rushed, I'm not very proud of how that crystal turned out. But that would be my some of my tips on like making it look like a crystal. So focus on the edges, pull in some of the background color to give it that translucent look, and be very conscious of where you're laying out your highlights. Okay, so I know we already hit, or we're getting close to hitting that hour mark, so I'm going to do some just quick edging and showing you guys how I would give this guy some more detail before I cut the stream off. And so if you have any questions, ask them now, and me and Joe <laughs> will do our best to kind of pound through them really quick. All right. Kylie Kennington asks, Tim, do you ever start a uh, piece in full grayscale and then come back and color it. Any tips on for doing so? Or would you suggest starting with color and shading with that instead? Uh, so for me, I've, actually, I've only started in grayscale a few times in my whole time drawing. I really enjoy working with color, so it's definitely a personal preference. But if you're just starting out, I think working in grayscale first is great to learn values and really understand and be able to recognize how to create shape and form. So yeah, I would definitely, you can start in grayscale. If you feel more comfortable in color, do it in color, but I'm not pushing for either. I would say uh, the best thing you can do if you want to add color after is don't just create a normal layer on top and then just kind of go for it. Try creating a, a layer on top of your, uh, your grayscale layers and then create either a color blend mode or a hue blend mode and then start laying out your colors that way before you start adding a normal layer of colors. And that way you'll still retain the values that you created in grayscale, but they'll just be with some hue added to it. Next. <laughs> um, I feel as though consistency and style go hand in hand. How can I practice being consistent as well as building up my style? I feel I am at a place where I can worry more about this. Yeah, that's I was about to start off my answer with don't worry so much about that. But if you're at a place where this is bothering you and you're like trying to figure it out, focus on what makes what you consider your style your style. So like I know for me, the way that I like I do my shading, like even this underlit area right here, I do this pretty much on every character I draw. And I think being able to recognize what makes your style distinguishable from other styles, or even like the way that you draw the eye shapes, the way that you draw your noses. Do you shade them from underneath? Do you usually make them more round looking? Having all those little things and then keeping it consistent in all of your pieces. So if you're a character artist, and I know that this is a two-edged or double-edged sword because then uh, a lot of people will say, well, all of his stuff looks the same. Right now, like even some artists, some great artists, like Zeronis is a like awesome artist, but a lot of people always... It's not always. They sometimes just comment on how all of his girls, they look the same, just with like different clothes on. And that's because he has a recognizable style. In my opinion, I think that's a great thing, because then you you can look at it, and in two seconds, you know exactly who did it. So I think being aware also of what you like. So for me, I really like hooded eyes. So usually most of my characters have hooded eyes to them. And then just kind of building from that 
knowledge, I guess. You'll be able to build your style from that. I think if you focus too much on technique, you'll get lost in like trying out a bunch of techniques. So I would say maybe just try like one or two at a time. And then over time, you'll be able to pick up what you liked from each style or each technique and be able to apply that to your own style. Question from Jose. I'm only 16 and I got invited to illustrate a book, but I think I'm so young and inexperienced, I'm afraid my work won't be as good as the expectation. Should I accept it and make the best of this experience, although I might not do the best job ever? How worth it is it for you, I guess would be my answer. If it's some money and like it's an actual job, then yeah, I would treat it like you were given a job and that you have to do your best. I think having that little bit of pressure actually is good. And having too much is bad, but having just a little bit of being like, you know, they have expectations on me, I really want to try to hit those expectations. I think that's actually a good thing. But if you just feel like you really are inexperienced for what the job asks at this time, then I would politely decline it and explain why. But it is a tough one because if you are getting job offers at 16, I mean, that's definitely saying something about you and your skill level at the time or at right now. And I think I would take that as a big compliment before uh, first and foremost. Lemon Thunder, I've seen some great artists that make use of photos and pre-made shapes in their work. Are there any pitfalls or advice to accumulating and using these sort of assets, or is it simply experimenting with what works? Um, if definitely, if you're trying to accumulate them, try to take your own photos. I know I just went to um, a couple of vintage stores over the weekend, last weekend, with uh, the girl that I'm usually always with, and... I took like a hundred reference photos of just like old trunks and cases and uh, keys and rust and textures and things that you know you couldn't find. I mean, you could find them on Google, obviously, but I think being able to have your own reference and being able to touch them, have that personal experience with them, I think can be more inspiring than just finding an image on Google. Um, and I guess what was the oh, are there any pitfalls? Was it? Yeah. Um, I guess relying on photos would be a big pitfall, but for the most part, I think having reference is the, uh, amazing. I think every artist should be using reference. I don't think it's cheating. I think it's only cheating if you're literally using it to create something that you cannot on your own. Because even a lot of artists will draw over um, photos, you know, uh, what's that, uh, matte painting, but they could do it on their own. Usually it's because they're on a production schedule and they need to get it done quick and fast, and that's why they do it. So they're not trying to take shortcuts. It's literally because they have to. So my only pitfall would be artists that think that they need to use photos to create something. There we go. I just needed a, I knew it once I created the eye area, I would feel a little better about this <laughs> character. If you had to start your art career over again, what would you have done differently? Hmm. If I had to start my art career over, I think the only thing I would change would be becoming more knowledgeable about tablets and Photoshop while I was in high school. I didn't even know what Photoshop, or I didn't even use Photoshop until I was in college, and I didn't even use a tablet until my second year in college. So I think if I was given more time during those you know, I feel like that's such like a learning period and I didn't have the tools to really help me along where I felt like I learned it all on paper and pencil and colored pencils when really I think I should have been starting to dabble in Photoshop. So I guess, yeah, I don't really have any regrets or things that I f wish I did more. How many more questions uh, can we go through? Um, let's do another 10 minutes worth. Okay. What time of day do you think is your comfort zone for artistic things? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I we find just that, talked about this. <laughs> um, um, well, not on the stream, obviously. I know yeah. everyone, every artist kind of differs, but I would say most artists are night owls. So for me, like the 
times I feel most productive are from midnight to 2 a.m. I feel like those are the hours I really am able to knock out some good art. I mean, it's a little inconvenient, I guess, but for me and my schedule, it kind of works out perfect because then I don't start work with Cookie until 10 a.m. So I still get like eight hours of sleep and everything. But yeah, I definitely have a weird sense of like when I'm best at getting things done. Yeah, with my Rachel, what would you say yours are? <laughs> with my with my sleep schedule that just got reversed because of the new job. I mean, I can't. I feel very unmotivated during the day. Like when the sun's up, I don't know. I just I feel like my feng shui is backwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm least motivated in the morning for sure. Yeah, and like for some reason, yeah, working at like two o'clock in the morning, it was like your brain just explodes with just <laughs> creativity. It's so weird. Well, especially when you're like talking with friends and I don't know. I think that's another good thing that I should say on the stream is try to find a good community of people that can draw with you without it being distracting. I mean, obviously it'll always be a distraction talking with someone because then your your mind's focusing even a little bit on like what they're saying or talking. But I think having that is such a good thing to have because as artists, a lot of times we get very, I would say we get, I don't say lonely, but we're definitely alone. And I think having that, uh, those couple people that you can always just talk to and they're able to relate to like having a schedule where you're drawing for eight hours a day, you know, that, I think that's a good support to have. So every artist should have that kind of support. Definitely. Oops. Um, Next question. I heard a lot of artists in the entertainment industry use their elbow to sketch and paint instead of using their wrist. Is this type way more efficient? This was something that Psycho was talking about too. I've never done it, so I can't really give my an opinion on it because I'm not even familiar with doing it. I know like for life drawing, actually I should take that back. For life drawing we were we did have to do that once where we would stand and we drew with um, not so much our hand like on the paper, but then we had to draw with like holding our arm up. So yeah, there's things that you can see, and that there's some things that are better. But I honestly cannot give you an opinion either way, just because I'm I don't know one way being the other. I've always done hand, so I can't tell you. When uh when you're in school, did they ever have you do the stick exercise? What's the stick exercise? They would take a for your like figure drawing class. They would take like a three to four foot stick and at the end of it they'd put a piece of charcoal and they'd tape it to it and you had to draw the figure oh God. with that stick and you can tell when someone was using just their wrist because they were doing really tiny marks but the only way for you to actually capture like huge movement is you'd have to rotate your uh, your rotator cuff in order to swipe up or swipe down <laughs> it was like that was what made our teachers like pick apart like who is like using your wrist and stuff like that. Because I use my wrist all the time for tiny sketching and like sketchbooks. But yeah. I mean, when we were at that, when we were at Spectrum, I mean, you had to use your wrist, you, or you had to use your your shoulder and your elbow because you had to be fast about things. Yeah, I would say for digital artists, if this is like your full-time job, I think it would actually get really tiring if you were doing full arm movements. I don't know. I, I can't say I, I haven't done it before. I would, I'm just like thinking about that right now. Like even right now my hand is like gently placed on the tablet. I'm barely moving it. And it's like small strokes. <clears throat> All right, next question. A uh, question from D. Brown. You talked about offering critiques from some of our art. What is the best way to get such a thing to you? Should I send via Twitter, DeviantArt, Coco? Also, what do you think of the anatomy book JW uses, Atlas of the Human, Ad Human Anatomy for the Artist? Um, okay, well, first I'll say, so the book that you're talking about, actually my boss has that, and he really likes it. But that is kind of an example of, like, comic book anatomy for the most part where it's all very beefy guys and the girls are all very petite with big boobs. And I think that is a great book to have or a great example to use. It's not one that I would personally use, but I still think it's a great book. And I used it for um, some of my... I remember I had a freelance job and yeah, I had to do a king that was pretty beefy. So I think it all depends on what you're trying to create. 
So if your subject matter looks like the reference, then yeah, that's perfect. I think just because of how much times I draw things that are more frail or more uh, feminine looking, I would use anatomy books of characters that aren't as like beefed up. They're not as muscular. And then how oh, do sorry. You... And then the other question, <laughs> um, to get the best way to get things to me is probably my email or. Actually, no, I would say my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, because I do check that, I would say, most. So in terms of getting things to me, just find my Facebook, my fan page, not my actual Facebook uh, friend page. And then, yeah, I will make sure to get back to you on that. All of a sudden, you have, like, 100, like, <laughs> friend invites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, next question is, do you have any personal original characters that you use in multiple art pieces? Yeah. Um, I'm actually trying to work on... Um, I know I feel like every artist says this, and that's why I try not to bring it up as much until I have some more product to show, but I'm working on an illustrated novel, and I do have ten characters, um, my OCs, if you will, and those I do draw a lot. I would say right now I draw my one of my main characters, Red, a lot, so if you ever see me draw a girl with red hair with shaved sides on both sides, and she's definitely a tomboy, those are that's one of my characters. So I would say right now that's a character I'm drawing a lot. Thank you for asking, by the way. Uh, can you define plagiarism and define referencing art? What is the difference between plagiarism and referencing? Using those definitions, describe what happens legally to their name to people who plagiarize art? Oh, man, this is a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I will do my best based on my knowledge. So the difference between plagiarism and referencing is very blurry. It's a very gray area because even big-name artists will use a Google image and just draw over it. So even though the or original image is fully covered and there's a new character on top of it, Technically, that would still be... Well, actually, I shouldn't even say technically because I'm not sure. But I know if you can get away with it, if you can make it look like your own work, then for the most part, it's accepted. But there's definitely a fine line, especially if like you Google someone's art and you copy over someone's art, then you're in a little more of a pickle where if you were just drawing over like a photo or something, you can probably get away with it a little more easier than if you were drawing over someone's actual art. So... I guess, what would des describe what happens legally into their name to people who play this art? Legally, I'm not sure, because I've never actually known anyone where they've gotten in trouble or they've, you know... I know in terms of, like, fan art, I guess you could consider that a form of um, stealing someone's work. I had one friend who had their... got an email and said they had to take it off of the, their online store. But then it's, it's strange, because then at, like, conventions... Even I sell fan art at conventions, but I I will not sell it online. And I think that's because it's widely accepted at conventions, but online, for the most part, it is not accepted. So you also have to be kind of aware of where you're selling it and being careful of that, but that's more related to fan art. I think when you're doing plagiarism, just don't do it. Like, I know even some of my stuff got stolen, and it was, like, from a school in some country I've never heard of, and it was bizarre. I mean, I found it actually to be complimenting, but uh, I'll, I remember my boss, or who was it? Someone told me, like, I should do something about it. But it's like, what am I going to do realistically? Because I'm not going to hire a lawyer. I'm not going to seek that person out and, like, you know, take them down. I think, for me, I'm just going to see it as a compliment. I wish they didn't do it, but I, I really am not going to seek them out and do anything about it just because of how much time and effort that would take into it and I'm not willing to give my time to do something like that. I'd rather spend my time drawing another piece. So I know for artists that's a tough decision to do but yeah, I'm not exactly positive on all of the criteria and all the circumstances just because I've never known or experienced anyone that actually went through like a big struggle with that. So yeah. Okay, let's take, like, let's say four more questions. Okay. Um, okay. This is a question that's 
kind of similar to when we had earlier. Uh, how do you balance work, not art-related, drawing and playing games, being social with friends? How do you organize or manage your time without getting distracted or lost? <laughs> you tell me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I do like all that stuff. I don't know. Um, I definitely try to make it a point that if someone invites me to like play a league of legal or a game of League of Legends, I will do it because I think it's important not to become too consumed in work. But at the same time, the opposite's also true. You don't want to be too consumed in doing other stuff that isn't related to art. So for me, I usually try to balance it on, like, what did I do today? I try not to think of it as, like, uh, okay, every week I'm going to spend four hours playing video games. I try to think of it, um, how much work did I do today? Do I feel like I could, if someone invited me today, could I spend an hour or two playing a video game? Yes, then I will do it. If I really feel like uh, I really should keep drawing, then I will keep drawing. But it is tough, I'll admit, like when someone asks you to play a game or, you know, you want to do something else, um, there's that temptation of being like, I can do this tomorrow. But I think if you do that enough times, it'll never get done. A lot of self-discipline. Um, and being social, I would have to say, I don't want to sound like a downer, but I'm really not social anymore. Like in college, I was definitely like, you know, I would be the one hosting the parties, I would, you know, organize all that stuff, and I really enjoyed it. But I'm glad I got that out of my system while I was in college because now I'm literally, you know, in front of my computer for 8 to 10 hours of the day and I'm not going out as much. So I would say it's a, it's a hard thing to, like, define, like, how much spare, spare time do I have to even give to be social. But just know that if you are an artist, you are going to be spending a lot of time in front of a computer, and I think that's something that you have to know before you get into this industry. Because if you, if this is something that is not appealing to you, if you are like, well, no, I want to be going out, I want to be seeing my friends, you know, you still can, but just not on like, a, definitely not on a regular basis. It'd be like maybe once to four times a month you'll actually see them in person. Because oftentimes, and not to sound like an even bigger bummer, but if you, a lot of your friends are art friends, they'll probably be moving a lot just because of our industry and a lot of the jobs are on the west or east coast or even in Texas. And sometimes our jobs will take us to different places where we can't control that, you know. So that would be my advice. Or that's my answer for how do I balance all that. All right. And this is probably going to be what, the last question. Any movies that inspire you? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love movies. I think this is, besides art, I think that's my number two thing that I really look forward to like, experiencing. Uh, I think a lot of my friends think I'm very negative about movies, but it's only because I love them so much that I, I value them differently than most people. Like I would say most people see them as an entertainment source, where for me it's not only like, entertainment but it's inspiring sometimes it's touching to the point where it'll affect the way I even see my life and I think those are the movies I really am drawn to so I would say the number one movie that has inspired me or like has really er, ah, that is such a tough question I would say Spirited Away when I was younger that definitely pushed me in a direction of like seeing what animation could be, what art could be, what um what storytelling could be, I think that was such a huge, like, major shift. And then one is, in high school, I would say Moulin Rouge was really inspiring just because of how uh, color can really influence a story and the mood and the setting and the way that it was so quick. I really liked Moulin Rouge. And then while I was in college, there's a movie called The Fall, and that movie was just a visual spectacle. And then recently, I would say it's called Synecdoche, New York, and that's my favorite movie of all time. It's really weird, and I don't, I wouldn't actually recommend it for people to watch, but it, it's very depressing, it's very sad, and that's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> but yeah, if you ever wanted to talk to someone um, about movies, I could talk for hours and not be bored. So yeah, that's a little bit about myself, I guess. Okay, so are there any quick little questions we can get through, or that is that pretty much it? That's that's a lot of the... Uh, All right. Yeah, we're good. We're already 20 minutes over, so I'm going to end it here. Um, I could probably easily make this guy a little better in, like with some more time, but I'm just going to call it done for now. 
I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Joe for helping me out today. No yeah. problem. Um, oh, that's right. I wanted to... I said I would show my fan art piece. Fan art. Yeah. Let me... Do, do, do. So, like I said, I will be in Chicago next week for Wizard World, and I will be there all four days. I'll have my own booth. And I don't even know if you guys can see this this well, or how well you can actually see this, but this is one of the pieces I'm still working on, and this is the Digimon Piedmon. I'm doing all three of the villains. Uh, Digimon was a huge inspiration for me when I was younger, just creatively and the way they did proportions and everything. It just was kind of awe-inspired. So I want to thanks every or thank you all for coming to this live stream. We do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m., and that is Central Time. That's minus 5 GMT outside of the States. And we will have a new tutorial tomorrow. Uh, the contest is still ongoing, so if you uh, want to test your luck and possibly win $200 in Amazon cash, uh, you go ahead and try the contest out. And then for those who have been waiting for a workshop announcement, it'll probably come next week. And the workshop itself will probably start uh, early September. So if that is something that interests you, definitely keep that date open. And as always, thank you guys for watching. All right, take care. Bye. And now you got to end it, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I hit stop. <laughs>
There we go. Bye, guys.